to conferences all the time is the main uh, driver for for progress in your skill set and also your relationship and basically any any professional can become a better professional by attending conferences. It's not the standard, okay? It's a movie theater, but the uh, visual is great and the sound is great and um, I've seen a lot of uh, room and space so, and I think it's organized well. Seeing all the people here today and they're excited about stuff uh, and you can, you can see the energy and the, the, the desire to learn uh, and do new things. And I was positively surprised about the depth, the technical depth of the sessions and how that makes the tester part of the team. I think developers do benefit from coming to QA conferences, uh, just the same as testers can benefit from going to dev conferences. Um, you know, you've got to have a, a broad understanding of what's going on. It's really inclusive, I would say, um, like it's super diverse, people are really, really open and friendly, and it's really organized. Conferences are well worthwhile for, just for the ideas that they spark in people. When people come back to the office, they are, they're full of ideas and they're, they're all energized up. Welcome everyone. We're going to talk about JavaScript tests in Node, the browser, and CI. And in particular, we're going to talk about JavaScript unit tests, which will be really, really fun. Come join us. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post this code on my site tonight. <laughs> You're going to look tonight, tomorrow, which is why it's online right now. You can come to robrich.org. You can click on presentations. Here's JavaScript tests in Node, the browser, and CI. And here is a link to the code, which is online right now. What's really cool about this code is we have both a start and a done folder. The start is where we'll begin today, and done is where we'll finish. So if you'd like to follow along, you definitely can uh, pull up the start folder. Or if you want to try this again, watching the video later, you most definitely can. Head over to robrich.org, click on JavaScript testing in Node, the browser, and CI, and get directly to this repo. While you're there on robrich.org, you can talk about, you can click on About Me, which will get to this page that talks about some of the things I've done recently. I'm a Microsoft MVP, a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities who otherwise couldn't afford software services. We start building software for them Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver completed software back to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you'd like to, if you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp in your area, hit me up on Twitter or by email, and let's get a Give Camp installed in your neighborhood as well. Some of the other things that I've done, I've worked on the Gulp Core Contributor team in version two and version three. And uh, one of the things I'm particularly proud of, I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! So there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. So let's look at JavaScript testing in Node, the browser, and CI. There are no slides, but here's the code, the repo that I pulled down. I started in the start folder, and we have these few uh, methods that we can dig into. But first, time to first it. Hello world.js. Um, it is that thing that um, it that wraps a test. So I need to have a test that will pass. And so I can say assert, and I can give it any command that will yield a true or false. So I want this test to pass, and then I can give it a reason. Reason, reason. So there's a test. OK, let's import assert from assert, which is a built-in library. And now with that, we have a test. From the command line, we can run npm test, and we can see that test pass. Time to first it, nearly nothing. That was really elegant, really simple to get that set up. Now, there's a few things that I've done behind the scenes. I did install Mocha and Chai, so we have that test runner. And then from my package.json, when I ran npm test, I just said, I'd like you to run Mocha. So perfect, time to first it. We've got an initial test, and it works great. 
Now let's come back to this add function. We want to create a test for this add function. So let's create a new file, test add.js. And it should add two numbers. Well, uh, we can wrap this in a describe block that will yield the tests in a group. So let's say this is the add group, and we'll give it a, a function there. And then all of the tests that are inside this function will run as part of this group. Now let's do a, a common testing pattern. Arrange, act, assert, arrange. So const x is 2, const y is 3, const expected is 6. Well, no, actually 5. <laughs> act, const actual equals add x and y. And then I can say expect actual to equal expected. Now, some assertion libraries will say expect actual comma expected. Those libraries are a little bit weird because I don't know which one is the actual and which one is expected. What I love about this chai expect syntax is that actual is definitely here and expected is definitely here. That's really cool. OK, so let's pull in um, chai from chai, chai, and let's import add from add. And now let's say const expect equals chai.expect. I wish that chai had a, a named export so that we didn't need to do this, but here we are. OK, so now we have this test. Let's validate that it works. Actually, let's save first. Save npm test. OK, so we're going to go discover all of the tests. Oh, <laughs> we can't find that add module. You're right. It is add.js. There we go. npm run test. npm run test will go find all of the files in the test folder. Now, we could uh, require is not defined. Test add. I don't have a require. This is going to get interesting. Require is not defined. I bet my package JSON does not have a type module. Oh, it does. OK, let me actually go diff this. Um, and let's figure out what happened. Compare. Test add in node. Test add. Yeah, that's fine. That is weird. Ah, I see. It automatically added a require for me. That's silly. <laughs> Test add. There we go. Now we have no require. NPM run test. OK, so Mocha is going to go discover all of the files that are in that test folder and run them. And we could rig this to do interesting things like discover all the files that are .spec.js. But in this case, all the files in that test folder is perfect. We were able to build that test. Now, this being JavaScript, um, add can do interesting things. So should add to strings. Uh, let's say this is A, and this is B. And now we expect it to add A and B. NPM run test. And we can see that now that test is running both of those. Here in this add group, we have both tests passing. Perfect. OK, so next we have this subtract function. So like any good tester, let's uh, say test subtract.js. 
And let's add in this. We'll change add to subtract. And we will replace that and run our test again. NPM run test. Now, uh, oh, actually, <laughs> so three minus two will be one. And there is no concept of subtracting strings. So let's remove that test. And now we've got a test that will flex our subtract library. Hmm. But we're getting errors. CB is not a function. OK. Well, our test may have helped us discover how our library works. Now, this library is intentionally simple so that we can focus less on the uh, coding and more on the solution. But the subtract library uses callbacks. OK, so how can we build a test here that does callbacks? Well, instead of doing actual like this, we can say subtract and give it a function. And that function will return error and actual. We'll move this assert into place. move this assert into place. And now we've got a test. Well, kind of. When the test runs, it will exit here. It will believe that it's done, in spite of the fact that this callback may actually be running. So we can take in a done function. And once we're done testing, we can call that done function. Now, that signals to Mocha or Jest that we have finished running our test. Let's also assert that error to equal null. Now, we could say falsy. We could check it for null or undefined. But in this case, we know that it will be null, and so we can do it that way. npm run test. And now we've got a test that will flex asynchronous code. We have told Mocha how to wait for our test to finish. and so that's great. We're all set. Next up, we want to test multiply. Now, multiply will return a promise. And so in our test, we'll need to do some thens. New file, test uh, multiply.js. And let's do the find and replace game. Subtract to multiply. and now let's multiply three plus two, or three times two is six, but this multiply won't yield this actual function. We'll say dot then function, and here comes actual. Again, we can take in the done function, and when we call done, then we know that that test is complete. npm run test. And we were able to test our asynchronous promise-based code as well. Ooh, it failed. Why did it fail? Actual, oh, because there is no error. That's why. <laughs> NPM run test. Now, what about rejected promises? Well, as part of Mocha, Mocha will wait for a thrown exception. All of these assertion libraries will just throw exceptions. And so we can just, uh, so for thrown exceptions, for rejected promises, we can tell Mocha, let's just return that promise. And now we don't need to call done. By returning the promise, we can tell it that whenever the promise is complete, um, then, uh, then that uh, test will be done, whether you get an error result, fail the test, or whether you get a success result, call that complete. So let's multiply 3 times 3, and we'll get 9. And that test will work great. Good multiply 3 times 3. So let's do this again, but let's do this with async await. So for async await, we'll make this async. And we expect this to be 12. And now we can say const actual 
equals await multiply. Now, async and await is promises under the hood. So in spite of the fact that we're not calling async await code, we're calling promise code, then this will work just fine. We don't need to now return anything because the async method will get turned into a promise under the hood. And so now we've got this promise-based code that we can flex with, um, with async await code. That's great. So we were able to multiply three times two with uh, um, then, and we were able to do three times three with done and three times four with promises or with async await. That's cool. We've been able to test synchronous code. We've been able to test asynchronous code with callbacks. We've been able to test asynchronous promise-based code, and we've been able to test async await code. That's really cool. Okay, let's take a look at uh, divide. Now, divide is just a synchronous method. So test divide.js. We'll hide add to divide. And we should divide two numbers. Well, three divided by three should be one. That looks great and should divide by zero. Dividing by zero is a thing, so let's test this. What if we say three divided by zero? Now, I would expect this to throw an exception. Now, it is possible to annotate our test to say we should expect an exception, but how do we know that the exception happened in our code under test? Maybe the exception happened here, const, expected equals three divided by zero. Well, that's no different than throw error. And so we don't know that that was the line that actually threw the error. Instead, let's specifically wrap this in a try catch. And what we want to grab is this error. So our actual isn't actually even the result of this divide anymore. Our actual is the error. So let's say actual equals error. So our expected now will be, well, the error code. Let's say one, two, three, four, five is the error code associated with this error. Or it might be divide by zero. Okay, so we expect actual dot code to equal expected. That's cool. We know that if an exception happens, it happens in this code right here, and it is this exception. If it succeeds, our exception will be undefined, and so we won't get this result. That's perfect. NPM run test, and let's see how this goes. Well, in this case, we found undefined doesn't equal divide by zero. Hmm. It sounds like we may be able to use our test to discover how our code works. Let's pop open the divide library. Well, it looks like the author of this library uh, looked at divide by zero and handled it in a very unusual way. Now, we do want to catch this more carefully. So let's instead say const error equals new error can't divide by zero. And we'll specifically give it error.code equals divide by zero. And we will throw that error. OK, now that we've uh, used our test to understand our library better, now we can take a look, and, and now everything passes. That's great. So we use our tests to prove our code. We use tests to discover edge cases in our code. We use tests to understand our code. That's really, really cool. Now we have a library, a suite of tests, that allows us to prove all of the things, both synchronous and asynchronous, both understood and misunderstood libraries. And in this case, it allowed us to correct our library in ways that didn't 
that we weren't uh, aware of. That's really cool. Now these tests, these unit tests work great in Node. Well, if we're doing code in React or Vue or Angular or another environment, we'll probably continue building in Node. But we may have services that we want to unit test, and we want to make sure that those tests will run in a variety of browsers. Node is interesting, but will it run on that exotic browser with that really weird rendering engine? Or, you know, these are again unit tests, so we're not doing end to end tests. If we wanted to do end to end tests in a browser, we would look to Cypress and test utils. But let's look at unit testing in the browser. Let's pop open number two. Now I have pre installed uh, Mocha and Chai again. And I've installed jQuery so that we can grab some dependencies. So here, let's say npx mocha init dot. Now dot is the path that we'll do this initialization in. And what mocha init will do is create a test runner that we can run in the browser. So here's that new index.html. And this is our test runner. We can pop this open in a browser and we can get at those tests. Now, it created this test.spec.js. We won't need that, um, so let's remove it. But we do want to go grab all of our test code. So let's pop open node, and let's look at test, and let's grab our tests. Perfect. So we will want to pull in um, test add.js, we'll want to pull in test subtract, we'll want to pull in test multiply, and test divide. In addition to that, we'll also want to pull in our regular functions, add, subtract, multiply, divide. And because they use chai, we'll want to pull in um, Node modules, chai, chai.js. OK. So now we have our Mocha libraries. We're, set, we're setting this up with the BDD test style. We've pulled in all of our code that we want to test. We've pulled in all of our tests. And then mocha.run will kick off those tests in the browser. Now we do need to modify these tests a smidge because right now, they assume that they're importing things. And because they're running in a browser now, we don't need to import them. Now, if we're using script type equals module, we could definitely import them this way. Or if we're using Node with something like Babel or Webpack, then we can import them that way. But now we've got, and uh, we didn't modify any of the body of the tests. We just imported our modules differently. OK, so let's pull up this test file, index.html, and let's start to look at how these tests work. OK, so we got many of our tests to succeed. We can take a look at the results of each test. Here's the test code that actually ran. That's perfect. We can also fire into a particular group of tests and rerun those tests. We see that we've got an error here, should divide by 0. Well, that test code looks OK. We are here in a browser, though. So let's come into Sources, and let's look at Test Divide. Let's set a breakpoint right here. And let's refresh this test and step into our breakpoint. OK, so we're good so far. F11 to jump in. And it looks like. We have that same bug. We're overtaking what divide by 0 means, and that's not really what we expect. OK, so let's come into our divide function and go grab our bug fix here, and we'll set that in place inside of our divide library. And we'll come back and we'll validate that this test now runs successfully in our browser. F10, F10. Yep, I got that error now. And so let's undo this breakpoint and push play. Ooh, we got a timeout. 
By default, Mocha will wait two seconds, and it's not uncommon if we're debugging tests to take longer than two seconds. I'll refresh the entire thing, and now look, we've got entirely passing tests. That's cool. Okay, so now we have this Ajax lib, some library that has a dependency. Let's do some tests there. New file, let's say test Ajax lib.js. And how will we form this? Describe test uh, Ajax, ah, Ajax lib, and we'll give it a group there. It should call the Ajax lib. Okay. Now, the way this Ajax lib works is we're going to pass in an ID and we'll go call this method and we'll either get a success or an error and ultimately we'll do a callback based on that data. Okay. So here in our test lib, let's do that same arrange act assert. So we would expect this to say, let's get all records and we'll pass in our ID. We'll pass in a function that we expect to get results from. This takes in an error and data. This assert will then go inside here and we'll call done when we're done. Done when we're done with this test. So let's take in a done here. Now it's not uncommon for us to have asynchronous tests. So I'll often either make them all async or always pass in a done, even if I'm using a sync method, just so that I can have a consistent experience. Okay, expect error to equal undefined, but even more so expect data to equal expected. Okay, so const expected equals, well, some data. And our ID, const ID equals, I don't know, seven. <laughs> okay, right now it's actually gonna go do that request. And that's probably not what we want. So, okay, so before, each, let's take control over how this works. Before each. Before each, we want to run this, and we will say that $.ajax equals function. Now, it's going to take in this options library that includes a success method. OK. so. Let's take in an options library. And let's call ops.success. And we're going to pass in null, and we're going to pass in expected. OK. So that's the, our fake Ajax library. That's cool. That says to me that we want this expected to be out here so it's available to both pieces. Now we will say const real Ajax equals dollar dot Ajax. Let's grab what it actually is so that then after each, we can be a good citizen and we can put it back. Dollar dot Ajax equals real Ajax. That's cool. What we did then is we create this get all records. Get all records will call into our Ajax library. Our Ajax library will call $.ajax, which actually is this fake Ajax library here. Here's $.ajax. It will take in these options. One of the options that Ajax lib passes it is this success function. So it will then go call success, passing in the expected. And the expected, then here's that expected, and it will call back with null and that expected value. We'll come back into our test with that expected value and we'll be able to prove our test. That's great. 
So let's come back in here into our index page and we will import script src equals test ajax lib and we will import script src equals ajax lib and we're also going to need to import jquery because our script requires it so let's grab jquery and now when we refresh the page we see that we've got a test that will do, oh, we've got a console error. Require is not defined. We've got that one again, test Ajax lib. Thank you, test for pulling in uh, my dependency automatically. <laughs> Const uh, expect equals chai.expect. There we go. Now we'll get our passing test. Now this is great. We've got Oh, expected null to equal undefined. We've got an error right here. This is null. OK, we've got a test that will start to mock out some dependencies. And jQuery is kind of a hairy dependency. So being able to do this is really, really cool. Now, this page does great at being able to run our tests. and that's interesting, but we can't exactly say, hey, can you pop open a browser and run this test and do all the things? That doesn't really work in a DevOps pipeline. So instead, let's switch to uh, CI. Well, what we can do, and again, we're in unit tests. If we were in integration tests, we would use uh, Cypress and test utils. But in unit tests, let's say npx karma init. Now, I have preloaded Karma. Karma is a unit testing in the browser framework. And so Karma init will actually go look through my project and start to, ah, command not found, Car <laughs> Karma. There we go. Karma will actually run all of the unit tests inside of a real browser. So what browser or what test framework would I like to use? I'll use Mocha. No, I don't need Require.js. What browsers would I like? I'll take Chrome, and I'll take Firefox, and those are the browsers. What, where are my test files? Star.js. And should I ignore anything? No, I'm good. Do I want Karma to watch all my files? Yes, I do. That's perfect. So with that, we now have this Karma in it that will do all of the things. Basically, it's the results of all of the questions we just got asked. Now, I do want to include the Chai library. I have pre-installed both Mocha and Chai here. But now in my Karma config, we can see that it will go look for all the JS files, excluding nothing. It will uh, watch for all of the files to complete, and it'll run both in Chrome and Firefox. That's cool. Let's go grab our tests. Uh, actually, let's go grab this one too and set those in place. Now, in this case, we could have chosen to put all of these tests in a test folder, and then we could say, well, go include all of my normal code and go include all my tests. But in this case, uh, because they just happen to be alphabetically uh, the tests are T and all the libraries are before that, we know our libraries will get pulled in uh, before our tests. NPM run test. Actually, let's do that a little bit differently. NPX karma run. So karma will actually kick up and, ooh, that's not right. Package JSON. Karma start, there we go, npx karma start. Karma will actually start up each of the browsers and run each of the tests. So here it's loading Chrome and it's running all my tests inside Chrome and it'll start up Firefox and all the tests will run in Firefox. And yes, it pops up this window on your primary monitor on the top left in the way of everything 
every time. That's <laughs> that's just the way it works. Okay. Now we ran all of our tests, but it looks like we have this divide by zero fail. Okay, so we got some failing tests straight away. That's really cool. Let's take a look at our divide.js. We probably know what's wrong here. Yep, let's go grab our answer here and we will uh, set this code in place. And because we're running Karma, it automatically retests our code and we now have passing tests in both Chrome and Firefox. This is perfect. Now this window is in the way, but if I close this window, Karma will notice that uh, Chrome isn't running and it will start Chrome again, popping it up right in my way again. <laughs> so for the most part, ignore these windows, but we can't click debug and this is just the browser. So pop open the F12 developer tools and we've got our sources again, so we can take a look at the code. And so we could, in the same way, fire up our tests and set a breakpoint and start to debug our tests. I find Mocha to be Mocha's test page to be a little bit easier for this, but you can use Karma's test page as well. Once you've got that running, then come back in here, refresh the page, and we know we have successful browsers. Well, that's great. We popped up the browsers over our screen, but in real life, we probably want to run headless. So here in our package JSON, I've run here um, karma start dash dash single run, which means don't auto watch things, just run it once and then exit. And I've also specified some browsers. Now, in this case, I want to run Chrome headless and Firefox headless rather than Chrome and Firefox that'll pop up Windows. So let's do that, npm run test. Now we do need X or X win, uh, X to be able to run them on Linux. So you know we do need a little bit of help here, but for the most part, these headless browsers work really well. You notice there isn't a Chrome and Firefox popping up over the top, but we still ran all of our tests inside both browsers. At this point, we got a success we were able to run all of our tests in the actual browsers, validate that our functions worked correctly. We were able to run tests even that mocked out dependencies, like the jQuery Ajax library. We were able to run tests that were synchronous, tests that were asynchronous using callbacks, tests using promises, and tests using async and await. All of these tests helped us understand our code, helped us discover our code, discover edge cases, and in particular, discover places where our libraries had errors. Tests are a great way to help us get better handle and better control over our uh, system so that we can mercilessly refactor and make our system more optimized. Tests give us that confidence because we know that our library works the way we expect it to. This has been really fun sharing with you uh, JavaScript tests in Node, the browser, and CI, you can grab this code, both the start and the done function here at GitHub. Grab, these, grab this code from robrich.org. Now, what are our questions? Let me flip over to Slido. I mentioned Cypress for end-to-end -end tests. Do I feel like Selenium has fallen in popularity? Great question. Selenium has been the de facto answer for integration tests inside browsers for the longest time. And it does do a really great job at remote controlling browsers. What Cypress does differently is Cypress will integrate deeply into those browsers. That's why Cypress doesn't have runners in as many browsers. The benefit though, because it's deeply embedded into the browser, we can do things like watch the Redux store or wait for browser events. With Selenium, we're waiting a second or two, assuming that that DOM element will probably be, vis be visible by then. With Cypress, we can say, wait for the DOM element to appear and then continue on. That makes it run much faster. And it can automatically retry around those pieces. Cypress has some great user experience as well around debugging um, integration tests inside browsers and has great integration on capturing videos of how that test run worked. So I can play the video when a test failed and I can go, oh yes, that's exactly there. 
I can reproduce it on my machine and navigate through each of those pieces. Cypress is a really cool library and this definitely isn't a Cypress talk, but I would love to do a Cypress talk. Reach out to me on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich if you'd like a Cypress talk in your conference or in your user group. That would be really fun. What other questions do we have right here? Do you use webdriver.io? What do you think about it? Interesting. Uh, Selenium will often use WebDriver or vice versa. <laughs> Those two libraries are very well linked. Once I found Cypress, I stopped looking. So honestly, I really haven't dug deeply into WebDriver. If you found a solution in either Selenium or WebDriver that works for you, you definitely don't need to throw it away. The goal is to get tests that give you confidence in your code. And so if you have a testing framework that works for you, by all means, launch into that and keep with it. Are there any easy ways to move from Selenium to Cypress? I heard that Cypress doesn't support some browsers. You're right, Cypress doesn't support some browsers. Um, in particular, Safari. <laughs> Thank you, Apple. Apple really doesn't like their browsers to be uh, test-driven. But there are a lot of support for uh, Chrome and Firefox. And now that Edge is on Chromium, then Edge support, I believe, is coming as well. And so if you can move to Cypress, if that list of browsers is acceptable, then Cypress can be a really good choice. The unfortunate part is that the Cypress library and the Selenium library are very different. And so it, it's probably going to be a very manual move. I would say do some experiments with Cypress and see if Cypress meets your needs for authentication and mocking and uh, test fixtures. And if it does, then start moving your tests slowly or write new tests in Cypress while keeping your old tests in Selenium. Slowly move those tests over if it makes sense or leave the legacy tests in Selenium and run the new tests faster in Cypress. Either way, if Selenium is working, then maybe Selenium is your best choice. Uh, there's no need to upend the world just because new tech came out. Great question, thank you. Have I worked with Appium and ADMCWD before? I haven't. I'm now really curious. Let me actually grab these, um, grab these, and I will go research them because that looks really fun. ADM, ADMCWD. I will take a look at those. Thank you. Well, this has been a lot of fun getting to uh, show you browser tests in Node, the browser, and CI. Grab me on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich if you find a question that you can think of tomorrow or if you're watching this video online. And you can grab the code for this session at robrich.org. Click on JavaScript tests in Node, the browser, and CI, and you'll get straight to GitHub with the repository that will give you both start and end solutions to be able to get you to your journey. I'll see you in a minute on the Ask Me Anything on Zoom. Thanks, everyone.